All right, let's see what we got here. We've got that. Eh. Some other lithics. Here's the other question. Oh, we've got biface fragments. Oh, a little tiny scraper there. Another scraper. Uh, two pieces of debitage. A drill fragment. Point fragments, yeah, okay. Sorry, uh, bear with me here, folks. Just getting things up and running for the day. Let's center this a little bit. A little bit unorthodox live stream, but here we are. Welcome to today's live stream. I'm live streaming the lesson for my archaeology field methods class today because they're learning about lithics. So I'm going to pull out a few examples. Those two will do. And we'll set these two guys aside. Yeah. Shazam. Ooh, yeah. Find it some more here. Ooh, okay. All right. All right. Okay. That's probably a good enough starting point. Um, right, so today we're talking about lithics. So this is going to be uh, no face on me today, but that's okay. If you're following along and you're just joining in, uh, this live stream is essentially, oh, my volume is very high. Let me change the gain here. Uh, so yeah, today we're talking about lithics, which is a fancy Greek term for stone tool. And you can pick up books like this one. Oh no, am I upside down? I am upside down. There we go. Uh, New York projectile points, typology and nomenclature. So this is just an example of an old school typology book. And I'll take this out into the field with me from time to time. And it kind of gives you a description of each of the projectile point types. So we're gonna talk about projectile points, but that's only one component of stone tools, right? Lithics, which comes from the Greek lithos, meaning rocks. So um, when we talk about stone tools, they're the most abundant thing in the, at least the North American archeological record. Um, maybe not so in other parts of the world, but definitely in North America, you're gonna be dealing with rocks more than any other artifact class. And just to give you some examples here, I mean, obviously we're working with some stone here, but if we throw them down, here's some examples of stone tools and then here's some more examples of stone tools. So you can see down here, these would be more ground stone. So things like axes, celts, etc. cetera. Um, and then we've got chopping tools, flake knives. I mean, we could go into the different like names for these types of artifacts. Um, this is obviously an old drawing and artistic rendering of them. Some things that we would call bifaces. We're mostly gonna be focused on bifaces. Bifaces meaning they have two sides, right? Uh, as opposed to other kinds of tools like these over here. Um, so when you're making a stone tool, usually you're starting out with something like this. This is what we would probably call a cobble or a nodule. So you're going to find this in a river. Um, my hand for size, I guess I could... Do I have a ruler around here somewhere? Yeah, I've got a little bit of a ruler for size there. Um, just for perspective. So this is pretty pretty large size cobble. And you'll notice it's worn. And the way, you know, so let's say you're an ancient hunter-gatherer and you're walking around the farm field, or not the farm fields, the walking around the river. And you'll notice right here, there's this nice flake pattern here that's been weathered over from, you know, water trickling over it and whatnot. So this is telling me right away, this is a chert or a flint. I use them interchangeably. You might say uh, flint, I might say chert, vice versa. So that's what we're gonna look for in this rock. You'll see some other conchoidal fractures along the edges here where it's you know, fallen off. This is from, as you can see written on here, Estill County, Kentucky. Um, and essentially if I were to crack this open, it was gonna look like something like this. So you can see on the inside how it has a very different texture to it. So this is when you start cracking away at the nodule or the core, 
um, it's a reductive medium. It's the same as, you know, for example, pencil and a pencil sharpener. Reductive medium. There's a pencil shaving. When I sharpen it, the pencil gets smaller. So in order to make the pencil, I have to remove material from one end. So it's going to get shorter and shorter and shorter. That's true of stone tools as well. So if I have a cobble, you can see on the outside here, this little weathered surface that we saw on our original cobble, this thing right here, is what we would call cortex. So all of this right here, all of this is cortex. And that's the weathered surface. So this is what is originally, I say original in air quotes there. This is what you would find um, in the river. And then as you start chipping away at it with a hammer stone, you start to expose the uh, matrix, which is the inside of the rock itself. I'm trying not to get too much of a bright light here. Let's see if we can't angle that down a little bit so it's less it's less less glaring, I should say. And you'll notice all these different directionalities here. These are different flake removals that we've got going on here. So um, inside of this matrix, we can start to interpret something that's going on with this. We would start to call this a core. So if it's just in raw form, we'd probably call that a cobble or nodule. Once we start working on it, we'll call it a core. So this is the earliest stages of reduction. So um, we're just removing flakes from the stone tool. And we're not going to get into, you know, the different um, types of stone tool technology. Um, but, you know, maybe you want to make this one cobble into a stone tool. Or maybe you want to make the flakes, the removed parts of it, into stone tools. And, you know, those are two different strategies that you might use. So we can see right here, and I'll try and get the oblique light on it. You can see that there's this little uh, valley and then there's a ridge right, right along here. And so if we follow it, it's like ripples in a pond. And so if we follow the ripples backwards, the flake was struck right about here. So if I was holding it, I probably would have, you know, if you can imagine my little pencil here is a rock and then I hit it like this and I remove a spall or a flake. So there used to be a flake on this. And your flakes could be chunky and big. They might be something like this. This is obviously a different flint. This is Upper Mercer. This is... Um, I believe this is known as uh, Kentucky Green, or possibly uh, uh, Paoli is another term for it. But we've got Upper Mercer here as well. And so these were from a core as well. And they're a little bit more angular. But you'll notice that we've still got those um, flake removal scars. It's probably a little bit difficult to see in the light here. But, ooh, actually, that's a good luster. You can see, you can see really good the flake removal scar here. And you can see maybe it's a little bit faint in the camera here. Let's see if we can't. There we go. You can see these ripples, right? Or maybe you can or maybe you can't. But there's a good ripple right here. And then there's some more right up along here. So that flake was probably removed by uh, applying force this way. So that's the directionality of the application of force. So the flake popped right off right there. And if we look at this flake, looking around at the flake removals, you can sort of make out... A little uh, ripple right here so the flake was probably removed this way uh, so we can start to learn basics of where the flakes are being removed um, and we probably call these you know early reduction sequence stuff so notice how obviously one of the nice things about making stone tools is you get these nice sharp edges so I can you know cut paper with this if I wanted to or actually can I cut paper with this let's find out I can in fact cut paper with it so sharp enough right uh, but obviously it's not in a shape that I'd probably want to do something with so probably not making much with that uh, this one also being roughly um, put in a shape here's some good examples of smaller flake patterns but you can still see those ripples in effect there and what we would call this flake pattern is called conchoidal fracturing um, don't worry about how it's spelled you could look it up it's c-o-n I guess I am spelling it but c-o-n-c-h-o-i-d conchoidal al yeah conchoidal fracturing um, and basically think of it like a giant cone so if i had a piece of glass i could make that uh, if i struck it it would evenly distribute like a cone of force but since we're only meeting a part of it here part of that cone is re reflected in the flake scar removals here i mean we don't need to get too into the weeds of it i suppose so as i said you know you got all these flake removal scars so if we go back to our our pretty little picture here which is probably hard to see because I'm going to cover up some of the light there. Um, you can see in the drawing that they've mapped in some of these conchoidal fractures and the directionality of them. So it's really important to know 
where those flake removals are coming from. So these little tiny, tiny flakes, flake scars, that you can see up along here, are probably retouch. So they're taking a larger chunk like this and they're reworking it into a sharper edge because, oddly enough, this edge that I just cut something with, this edge right here, um, it's probably not going to be very durable because it's very brittle. So this is not going to last me very long if I start using it to cut things. Eventually, you're going to want to um, take, um, I guess you could say, remove flakes off of this edge to reinforce it to create essentially, um, not to get into the physics of it, but the more arises or ridges you have, so you can see here's a ridge here, the more you have on the edge, the more... Um, structurally sound it is. So you can see this one's got a little bit more, but if we really want to take it to its extreme, and maybe we want to make like a little scraper here. Now all of these are um, modern, so I've flint napped all of these. I mean, it's not not to say I'm some magical flint napper, but I did flint nap all of these um, into some rough shape. Now this is an actual artifact. So it's probably hard to make out, but you can see, look at all those flake scars we've got going on here. Now if we flip it over, you can see it's got flake removals on both sides. Probably hard to see in that oblique light, but you can see, look at how tiny those flake scars are. Oh, where did I drop my, oh, I dropped my pencil. But you can sort of make out in the reflection of the light there, you got these flake scars and they're coming down, going that direction. And we can sort of, actually, let me see if I can't get a closer view here. It might be really hard to see. Uh, maybe work with me here. You can sort of make out there's a lot of flake scars on the edge there. You might see them a little bit better when I put my thumb against it. But those are reinforcing this edge because it was probably used to sharpen something. And then it's probably also a little bit difficult to see. We can sort of make out, maybe you can, maybe you can't, but this is looking at it tip out, at the tip on. You might notice a little curviness to it. That curviness is actually a bevel. So this blade side is higher than this blade side, so it kind of makes a rotationalness to it. So almost like it's spinning in the air. That's not actually why um, you get a lot of beveling in things, but that's just an example of a biface. So two faces are used. And here's some more examples that I'm going to pull out here of basically utilized flakes. Just more examples of actual artifacts that were removed. So here's a great example of some of the components of a flake. So we're just going to angle this. Oh, sorry, headphone users, if you're listening in there. Hopefully that wasn't too loud. Oh, come on. There we go. Okay. Sorry, I'm just making the light a little bit more oblique so you can see some of these surfaces a little bit easier. All right. So you can see a flake scar on the ventral surface here. Ventral meaning this is where the stomach of it is. I mean, we use similar anatomical features. So dorsal, the back side of the flake. So if you can imagine... If this is our cobble, the ventral surface is removed from the rock. So, I mean, actually, probably more realistically, something like this. This is not actually from the cobble, but when it's removed, so here's the flake, here's the core, and the ventral side is the side that used to be on the core. So that's what's going on here. And you'll notice it's got this really odd curvature to it. So we can start to classify our flakes by... Um, you know, removal types. That's going to start to tell us something about the manufacturing style. So because this is curving in, that's telling me a little bit about maybe the quality of the stone, but also maybe the skill of the flint napper or intentionality and in design. We'd probably call this an overpass or outrepasse. And we like to use French terms for our lithic reduction because it's, it's overshooting where it actually wants to go. And that's why you get this little sort of uh, lip here. Not ideal, right? Because we want a nice sharp edge. I can't exactly cut things with this edge right here. But if we're looking at the ventral side, a few things to note. If I can maybe get it in less bright light. Actually, let's see if this helps a little bit. Oh, yeah, that helps a little bit. Not by much, though. Okay, other things to note. You can sort of see this little step here. Uh, it looks, looks like a flat surface, right? Um, <clears throat> this flat surface is actually what we call the platform. So what you're looking at right here, and it might be really hard to make out, see if we can't readjust yeah now you can really see that platform now that my hand is covering up the light yeah we're going dark but you can really see that platform sticks out like a sore thumb right that platform also has a little bit maybe you can see it maybe you can't if you're looking right below the platform right here 
you can sort of make out what looks like a bulb. That's known as the bulb of percussion, which means the rock struck it right here, and that's what propagated all of this, this flake removal. So this is not telling me anything about the flake removal, but the platform and then the ventral side is going to tell me something about how that flake was removed. Uh, and then well, what's interesting is if we flip to the dorsal side, the back side, it tells us a slightly different story. It tells us all of the previous removals before this one, right? Uh, so we can see we've got, well, maybe we can't see because it's still, again, a little too bright. Let's, let's make that light a little bit more oblique just because it's so bright and lustrous. Um, we might be able to see this, there's a flake going this way. You can sort of make out ripples in the pond, like I was saying. It's probably really hard to see there. But you see a couple of ripples right here, right? So that's telling me that this flake is being removed and the direction of the force applied is that direction where the pencil is going. The pencil is pointing, I should say. So we've got some flake removals here. We can also see, it's probably really hard to see on this camera, we've got some cortex on this. So it's probably early stages. Oftentimes that's true of ultra passe or overshot flakes is they're usually to get the core into some sort of shape. So the size of this flake is telling me something about the context of this this um, flake, or rather flake, the reduction sequence. So they're probably prepping a core for more reduction later, right? This is not going to be turned into a stone tool. This is core preparation flake. So even though I don't have a tool here, this waste material can tell me something. Just like if I were to open up my pencil sharpener and look at all the pencil shavings in there, I can start to learn about what kind of pencil was being used, what kind of design. I mean, obviously it's a pencil sharpener, so it's used to sharpen a pencil. But if you can imagine, the wood shavings and chips are going to be used to figure out, you know, the length of the pencil, um, what kind of pencil was it used for, um, how do they prepare the pencil, the wood to make the pencil, yada, 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 so on and so forth. So that is just one example of a flake. I've got another example here that I'm going to walk through. Um, here is probably a more ideal example of a flake. So you can see, oh, where is the bulb of percussion here? Okay, so on this one, it's probably a little bit more difficult to see. And again, it's very lustrous, so probably not the best. But you notice when I give it an oblique light, look at the surf, the ventral surface here. So this is, you know, the original core was where my finger was, and then it boop, popped off of the core if the core is my finger. <clears throat> So you can sort of make out a little bit of a ripple, right? And so where my finger is, my left index finger, that's our bulb of percussion. You can really see, look at the shadow that it's casting in this oblique light. Here's our bulb of percussion, which means this is our platform. Now you're probably usually, you usually want to use some sort of magnification to check out bulbs of percussion and whatnot. In this case, you can't really make it out on the camera, but you also have flake scars on the bulb of percussion. What's neat about that is it tells me that that flake right there is likely the result of removal from a biface. Because remember I said a biface just has two faces, so here's an example of a biface, right? And sorry this is so dark lighting, but such is life when you're dealing with highly lustrous materials. So when you have this edge like that, the way you're going to remove it is by striking it on one of the other sides. So if you can imagine, I take a rock and then I whack it, usually on the edge, just bam, like that. And I'm taking with me on the platform the edge that used to be on the blade. So really what's neat about these, these kites of flakes is I'm seeing on this bulb the former dulled blade of a biface. So, you know, you need to resharpen it. So you need to remove this dulled edge. And so you do that by removing this flake. But what's neat is if the platform is still intact, I can start looking at this and start to say, hey, this is what the edge of the blade used to look like of something like this, right? So if I were to resharpen all of this and rework the edge of this entire thing, I would have, in theory, all of the edge in each individual flake. So little components of it. So what's fun about, I guess you could say, what one of the things that I love about stone tools is essentially it's as close to a written record as I'm going to get in prehistoric archaeology because I can see every previous flake removal, right? So on this one, we've got at least one, two, three, four, oh, sorry, let's, let's get some more oblique light for you here so you can see a little bit more. So let's let's look at the facets here. We've got at least one flake removal, a second one. We can see a third one going this way. Uh, 
And again, directionality is going to tell you something about, you know, maybe how this is formed. Then we've got another flake scar removed here. Um, and this is more akin to the kinds of, of terminations you expect in flakes, right? A lot thinner, right? I mean, you want to save yourself time in making a nice sharp edge. You want to make a thin blade. So this might be useful to resharpen it. In fact, it's really hard to make out on this one. But along the edge here, there are these tiny, tiny, tiny flake scars. Um, something that this drawing does a little bit better, basically a zoomed in version of. Sort of how you see all of these little flake scars along the edge here. Those are what we would call either flake retouch or resharpening. So it's really difficult unless you get a microscope to distinguish between retouch and utilization. But essentially, if I were to start using this flake, as I'm using it, I'm actually making tiny, tiny flake scars on there. And usually if it's intentional, they're going to be much larger. But in this case, it looks like it might have just been like used to, you know, cut something. Maybe I needed to trim my hair on my arm, so to speak. And in doing so, I take off these teeny tiny flake scars. And in fact, you can sort of make out, maybe if I hold it against the, the uh, darker background here, you see how there's like little dimples in it? And it looks like it's, uh, you know, a bumpy surface. Those are those tiny, tiny flake scars, um, usually indicating utilization. And this would be, you know, we'd call this a util utilized flake. Right, so those are just a few things. We could get into all the different tool types um, based on what we're, what we're working with here, but we're not going to get into all those different tool types. The main thing we're going to focus in on is bifaces, and that's because bifaces are the most common tool type. So I just showed you one. I'm going to show you another. Actually, sorry, before I do that, let me pull out another. Oh, this is a great example. So you see that edge? Here's another beautiful example of a utilized flake. So we've got, here's the nice dorsal surface. You can see those really nice ripples here. So there's a flake that was removed boop, 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 that way. Um, and then we see a termination here. Uh, probably terminated not intentionally. Um, oh, yeah, there you go. This platform. Okay, so it's probably kind of hard. You can see the edge of it. Here's the lip of that platform. The lip, because if you can imagine, if we take out our biface here, patience, patience, imagine it this way. So here's your, your flake removed. This is what it would probably look like. It would probably come off this way. So here's our ventral surface. You know, you see one singular flake removal. See those nice ripples in the pond there pointing back to our bulb of percussion and our lip and our platform. So this is where the flake was removed. And you can really see, so here's the edge of a bifacial blade. And then here's the platform of a blade. And you can see the same little snippets of flake scars, right? So we're actually looking at, in this case, a scraper, which it's called a scraper because it's usually used for drum roll scraping. Um, well, not always usually for scraping, but that's what we usually call these. So it was removed from a biface at some point, And if we look at it on edge, you probably can't really see much, but this is a dulled blade edge. And so it was broken off of the stone tool and then they decided to rework it into a scraper. So if we look at it, mm, probably can't really see it too well. But there's a sharp drop off here that in the oblique light you can sort of make out. See, notice how I'm holding at this angle and then there's just dark shadow along the edge here. Because there's a steep incline of all these tiny little flake scars. What they're doing essentially is creating a nice little trapezoid, cr creating a nice little lip so that you can use it to scrape with. Um, think of it like creating a reinforced surface that, you know, if you're going to be rubbing hides all day, you want to have a good sturdy uh, scraping edge. So that's an example of retouch on a flake, although in this case this flake is removed from a biface. So there's a lot going on in this flake. We can say immediately, okay, it's bifacial thinning flake. It's being used to either resharpen, rejuvenate a, a dull blade edge, but it's from a biface because the platform has two sides to it because it's from a biface. Um, and thus the platform has a bunch of these little flake scars on it, on the inside of the lip. So that's the first thing that we can say. And the second thing is based on this, this uh, clunky termination here was not ideal the way they removed it. So the biface probably has a nasty looking what we call step fracture in it. So it wasn't removed properly. And then what they did with this flake is they worked it into a scraper. So lots of things going on in this example. 
So now we're going to move on to bifaces. So when we're talking about bifaces, and I'm just going to migrate these guys over here, I've already shown you examples. So here's a here's some examples. These are you know really old examples of bifaces. You've got you know your Eden, your agate base, and plan view. These are what we would call Paleo-Indians, so some of the earliest stone tool types in North America. But they are also bifaces. Now, how do you identify bifaces? Well, there's a few ways you can figure it out. I already started off this lesson talking about things like um, New York projectile points. This is just a quick reference. A lot of, I mean, we can get into the nitty gritty of classification types and, you know, the utility of looking at pretty pictures and descriptions and saying, hey, it looks like this, therefore it's this type. You know, we get into the weeds with that kind of stuff. Um, you know, if we were doing an archaeological theory class, I'd explain why we should be cautious of just looking at pictures and saying one to one, hey, this looks like that. Um, oh, and for reference, here is what an arrow point looks like, and it's two scale, or at least two scale of my finger. Might be a bit big, big one, but here's another example as well. Arrow points pretty much just look like triangles. Um, you know, Richie, the guy who wrote this, distinguishes between these two types, but in all honesty, they're basically just triangles. So these are your only actual arrowheads. Uh, everything else is, um, actually, I think it specifically, I thought I saw the word arrow somewhere in here. Um, well, anyway, everything else is a uh, spear or dart point or, you know, atlatl point. But there was a nice illustration at the beginning of this um, handy dandy guide. I mean, it gives you a lot of the different time periods over on this side. But what we're really interested in is some basic sort of nomenclature about projectile points type. Projectile point, um, I guess you could say, um, anatomy. So, you know, he's using terms like side stem, corner notch, straight stemmed, expanding stem, et cetera, et cetera. But he's also labeled a few things here. So when we're looking at projectile points, there's somewhat of a standardization. You'll find some people like to orient things with the projectile point facing south, or not south, gosh, the bottom of the page. I like to have the business end of a projectile point facing the top of the page, the top of the page where someone's reading. Um, we call these these parts right here notches. So we've got notching on this one, but not on really anything else. And then we can separate it into the haft element, which we would call um, pretty much from here to south or here down, haft element and the blade. So up here is our blade element, down here is our haft element. It's called the haft because if you can imagine, if this pencil is my spear, I need to tie it to my spear or my dart. Same with down here, how these are going to be all hafted together. So these are different haft elements. And the important thing about that to compare to a pencil, and this is where we can really get into the weeds with things like allometry, is the length of the pencil is going to change over time, right? Because we're going to keep sharpening it and sharpening it and sharpening it. But the thing that's not changing is the eraser attachment, the thing that holds the eraser to the pencil. So the relationship of the length of the pencil to the length of the eraser head is going to tell me something about the amount of resharpening that's been done. So that's something that Ritchie back in the 1970s had not thought of. And so some of his types, like this one over here, or what he calls Brewerton, which we could actually flip to. Oh, it's in here somewhere. Right. So actually, this is a great example on these two pages. Um, so we've got um, Brewerton eared triangle points over here. And then we've also got Brewerton side notch projectile points. But really, what we're looking at is the same thing, but they've resharpened these, these notches until they've resharpened past them. So these are the same era of projectile point. It's just at different stages of reduction. So it'd be the same as finding a pencil that's this much sharpened and a pencil that's sharpened this much and calling them two different types when in reality, it's the same person making the two different pencils. It's just they're at different stages of their use life when they were being used. So anyway, back to our diagram here. So we've got the haft element and we can call, you know, this is the stem or the haft element down here. So this is what we would call a stemmed point. These ones over here, expanded stemmed. These ones are notched points because they have notching on them. Other elements to keep in mind is we've got the um, barbs or ears, or you could even call these shoulders. So these would be the shoulders of the point. These are the basal corners of the point. Here's your blade. Uh, and as I said, haft and blade element. And then again, here's your um, you know, arrowhead down in here. So that's just some general anatomical things to keep in mind. 
we could get into the nitty gritty of like looking at the blade stem ratio and all that kind of fun stuff, but those are the basic anatomical things that you should know about projectile points. So let's take a look at a couple of projectile points that I have pulled out. So we've got this guy right here, little itty itty bitty, and then we'll pull out this other one right here. And of course, our light source is very oblique because we need to be able to see those flake scars. So if it looks like I'm getting in a lot of shadow, we want a lot of shadow when we're looking at lithics. It makes it, th it makes identification in the lab a whole lot easier. So we can see if we flip this one over, maybe it's a little bit easier to see. We've got a um, stemmed point right here, right? We've got a nice straight base, nice square stem. What's interesting about this one, and it might not be so obvious on the camera, is we've got a platform here. So we know right away this was made from a flake. This entire projectile point came off of a flake. So this little corner right here is a platform because it's flat and it's the start of a flake. And we can sort of make out a bulb, sort of, but it's been removed by flake removals. But that's also cortex. So if we remember back to the beginning of this lesson, cortex is the weathered exterior of our stone, of our cobble or our nodule. And then the matrix is the interior. So if this is the cortex, that tells me at some point this was on the outside of the stone. So it could have been boop, popped off like that. It fits pretty good in there, doesn't it? Pops off like this. And then they took that flake and they worked it into a, into a stone tool. So that's telling us a little bit something about the thought process and design of this stone tool. We're also missing a bit of the tip here. Um, you'll notice it's, it's, it's gone. Um, that happens a lot in how they're recovered. In this one, it's not so obvious, but it was probably lost on impact. So, you know, you land in, inside of a, a um, animal or you hit a tree or whatnot, and that impact is actually going to break the tip. And so that's what we would call an impact fracture. Not so obvious on this one, but that's one of the reasons why it's not, excuse me, it's not completely intact. And then we've got this other itty bitty guy here, a much better example of a um, impact fracture right up in here. If you can see what's going on in here. A lot more flaking going on here. This is more akin to that Brewerton example I was talking about earlier. So it's probably a heavily resharpened. Notice the difference in how the bases are flaked. How we've got this big channelized flake here on either side of this projectile point. But then when we come over here, you can sort of make out, maybe, maybe not. Here, let's see if we can't. There we go. Um, you can sort of make out these little tiny, tiny flake scars at the base of this projectile point. So you can see boop, 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 tiny, tiny flake scars here. Uh, and again, the, the spacing of the flake removals is much tighter and much nicer than on this one. It's a little bit more crude on this one. And that could owe to multiple factors of the material type that's being used, um, the skill of the flint napper, and the desired product, the time that they need to make this stone tool, et cetera, et cetera. And then you'll also notice on this one, we've got a little bit of what you might call um, serration. So it's a little bit hard to see. So if you've ever held a, sna a steak knife, it's the same concept, serration. You can see those little barbs there on the on the blade. Makes it great for sawing things. If you want to, you know, make something bleed a little bit more, serration is really good for that. Uh, what am I missing here? Am I missing anything else? I mean, I've got a few more examples I could show you of different stone tool, or rather, raw material sources. So here's just another example. This is... Um, the Ohio State Mineral. So this is Flint Ridge Flint. It's um, probably hard to make out the color in this bright light, but you can see it's very different from the other examples I have here. So Upper Mercer, Kentucky Green, and then Flint Ridge in terms of color scheme differences there. That probably helps out a little bit. You can see a little bit of the color differences between Flint Ridge, Kentucky Green, and Upper Mercer. So there's some examples as well. I think I think that's all I needed to talk about with uh, projectile points and stone tools. Um, there's probably a lot more I could talk about, but I think we're going to leave it here um, just because um, there's a lot of unknowns. Uh, so the, to recap, you start off with a cobble or a nodule similar to this guy right here. You find that in a river. And some of the dead giveaways are, uh, you know, weathered or eroded conchoidal fractures like this right here. It's usually a dead giveaway that if I'm hunting for flints and shirts to use to turn into something, 
that's going to tell me, oh, if I crack this open, it's going to look something like this. And so this is our core. So we start removing flakes from it. And flakes or cores, either way, we're going to start making stone tools, usually bifacially flaked. And our final product is going to be something like a biface, which we can sort of make out in here. Or this is a biface in the making, although honestly, this one's been dinged up a lot. Um, you're probably not going to be able to make much with this. So one of the benefits, I would say, of taking a stone tool and flint napping with it is it's going to give you a better appreciation and a better understanding of what you're actually looking at. So for those who are not familiar with looking at this stone tool, I might look at this and instantly say, hey, this is probably where I want to start removing the next flake because that's a nice low point, really good flake removal spot. But then I flip it over and I say, oh, this does not make a great platform. And I've got, you can probably make out a little bit, this dark line here is a shadow because it's creating a bunch of what we call hinge fractures. So this is where the stone's going to want to break if I were to strike it here. So if I took a stone and whacked it right here, I probably am not going to get a nice clean flake that goes the full length of this stone. So I might want to start to look around and I see, oh, uh-oh, here's some more of it. If you haven't caught on already, um, here's another hinge fracture. If you haven't caught on already, I'm not the best of flint nappers and this is also one that's really, really old. So you can see this stone is going to be really hard to flint nap. Here's some more hinge fractures, which basically means if I want a nice long flake that goes the full length of this stone, I'm going to have to deal with all of these hinge fractures up here. So I want to get rid of them. And so once you start to get a handle on flint napping, even if you're not good at flint napping like me, you can start to then appreciate and understand and get into the mind of past flint nappers. So if we compare that to, say, um, this uh, piece of stone, I've got a lot of, of blank real estate to work with. But then I notice also, um, and this is one of the problems with Flint Ridge Flint, I've got this vein of quartz right here. So that's a bit of an issue. So if I'm going to flint nap this, that's going to be a natural weak point in the stone. So depending on how I strike this, anytime I strike the stone, this is where it's going to want to break and fracture is along this weak point in the stone where the uh, quartz is. Whereas if I had to strike it over here, probably not such a big deal. Here's another quartz inclusion, probably hard to see, but quartz inclusion right there means anytime I strike something over here, that quartz inclusion is a natural fault point. So that's another thing to keep in mind too, is once you start flint napping, you get a better appreciation for um, you know, how things are made and thus you can interpret the quality of the stone tools that you're working with. So that's gonna do it for stone tools for today. Hopefully you got something out of it and uh, you know you can rewind it and replay it and go back through things again um, to check out the things I was talking about. You could even, I think, I think this was like four bucks on Amazon is how I got it, but that was granted like three years ago. Um, you probably could still find this on Amazon um, if you live in the New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan region. The projectile points mentioned here are roughly similar to ones that we still use today. So that's something else to keep in mind as well. So that's going to do it for today's video. Um, I don't know when I'm going to be doing the next live stream, possibly next Thursday. We'll see how my schedule permits. The summer is pretty busy. Uh, but until the next time, never stop learning, and I will see you then.